Well, welcome. As you said, my name is Ellen. I'm the Education Director over at the Dollar Center um, next door. Um, I know at least one of you has not been there. Have, any, have you guys been to the Dollar Center at all? Yeah, okay. Um, we are in the pro we've just gotten our new director over there, and we are in the process of adding all sorts of new stuff. Um, so if you've not been there for a while, you might want to um, stop by. And as a matter of fact, shameless advertising. Um, we've got some Rediscover Tour, Rediscover Dom tours coming up. So um, there's two of them coming up. The dates are on the back there. We're all together. Over. Sort of. Okay. <laughs> Thank oh. you. That'll work. Um, yeah. Saves are on the back. And, um, oh, wow. Come on. <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to come and be on the tour, it's about an hour. Um, one's in the morning and one's after work hours. Um, and there'll be more coming up throughout the year if you can't make either of those, and but you want to still go on one. Um, and you'll learn a little bit about what Dalm is and what direction we're going um, and some of the changes that we're making. So it's kind of a nice way if you've been there for a while to, to get to meet us all over again. But today, we're here to learn some basics about animal tracking. Um, and before I get into animal tracking, I want to know what your experiences are with animal tracking. If you have some, little, none, whatever. Ben? A little bit. Yeah. I can see footprints and tell direction to move usually. <laughs> okay. Place to start. It's just a little bit. It's a little bit. Okay. Um, we're gonna include you guys. <laughs> I have a dog that runs away a lot, so. Okay. That's excellent. My family hunts, so of course. Okay. Because um, usually I found um, when I do this program, I get quite a handful of people who are hunters. Um, uh, I do get people who have their dogs, but they don't always actually take their dogs for walks or watch how their dogs move. But I'll tell you, having a dog <coughs> is a great way to learn your tracking um, if, if you really want to get into it. Um, so with tracking, there's tons of resources out there, and each one's going to tell you something different. And that can be problematic. Um, if you start reading different books, you're going to end up confused because one does a particular measurement this way, another one does it so that it measures a different distance, um, another one measures it on a diagonal, you know, so, and they're all calling it the same thing. So it can be very confusing. So um, what I'm doing is I'm following the work of a fellow from out west named James Halfpenny. And he teaches uh, tracking, he's a college professor. Um, he teaches wildlife tracking, um, and he's training other trackers to do it in a scientific method so that everybody's on the same page. So if we talk about the stride and the straddle, we all know what we're talking about, and it's the same thing. Um, so I'll be using his, his terminology, his techniques, but I do want to recommend a whole bunch of books that are out there. Um, I may be a nature nut, but I'm also a bibliophile. Um, I love books, and there are tons and tons and tons of good books out there um, for tracking. Um, and then there are some that are not so good. So these are some of the really good ones that are out there. Um, Paul Resendez, Tracking the Art of Seeing, has been around a long, long time. Um, what's nice about this book is it's got lots of natural history in it. So it's not just, here's a footprint, and there you go. Um, but it shows you the animal's feet, it shows you the tracks, it shows you trails, it shows you their scat, which is where they've gone to the bathroom. It shows you um, where they've been eating, um, tr uh, all sorts of good information in here. So this book I do highly recommend, except for the way he measures things. He's one that measures on diagonals, and it's really weird. Um, another one that's been around since the dawn of time is Tom Brown. Um, he's known as the tracker. And um, he's from New Jersey, and he has tons and tons and tons of books out on all sorts of outdoor skills. He runs an outdoor skills school. Um, he really gets into tracking at a whole um, other level. We're not even going to be remotely near this level at this point in time. But he talks about pressure points and can, can age tracks. Um, and stuff. He can find 
tracks where you would swear there are no tracks at all I mean, you can find them. Um, so, so if you really want to go to tracking to that level, I do recommend Tom Brown's books. Um, James Halfpenny does have this small series, which is Tracks and Scats of the Insert Area of the United States here. Um, this one is the Midwest. There's also the Great Lakes. I, I'm from New York State, so the ones that I group, you started using as um, Scats and Tracks of the Northeast. Um, these are nice little pocket guides. So these are just going to have the name of the animal, what the footprints look like, what the basic gates look like. We'll talk about that. <coughs> Some measurements. Um, and um, often an illustration of what the scats look like. So this is a nice little pocket guide to have. But you're not going to learn a lot about the animal with this one. Um, Probably the ultimate ones are this series right here. They are very heady, so I, they're not really pocket guides. I wouldn't take them out in the field. But they are full of, um, again, information on how the animals move, how they make tra tracks, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, photographs of footprints. Then they've got photographs of dens in there, photographs of scats photographs of um, marks that animals leave behind, <coughs> as well as feeding sites. Um, so tons and tons and tons of good information in these books, too. <coughs> so when we're done here, feel free to take a look at any of these books. They're well worth uh, investing in if you want to be tracking. I do have some handouts here. These are very basic. Um, go over some of the stuff that we'll be talking about today. <coughs> and some of this may look very confusing, especially that front page, but trust me, it's real easy. So animal tracks are an animal story. Um, a lot of times we go out and we just say, oh, well, there's a deer track and that's that. But if you take the time and actually look at what the tracks, where they are and how they're positioned, you can um, determine what the animal was doing, where it was going, why it was doing that, and so on and so forth. Exceptional trackers can go out there and see some tracks and say, oh, well, this was a female coyote. Um, she is in heat. She stopped here and looked over her left shoulder. And you can tell all that by the tracks. And yes, you can tell all that by the tracks. It is amazing. Um, I'll give you some of those tips today, but uh, that's, that's pretty advanced um, stuff. So tracks are an animal story. First thing we're going to start on is the track formula, which is, here it goes. <laughs> Ah, which is on the front page of your handout there. This came with me from New York, so it's been well used and does not stick too well. Which is why we have binder clips. <coughs> oh, we got one too. Excellent. So the track formula. Looks intimidating, but it really isn't that bad. And since most of you over here, we'll bring this a little closer. F stands for the front foot. H stands for the hind foot. That's pretty easy. Whichever one is capitalized, that foot is the larger of the two feet. And we'll talk why that is in just a moment. The number is the number of toes that you will see on that foot in the track. Um, if there's a number in parentheses, Sometimes you'll see that in any toe prints. Um, other things you might see in the formula is the letter C. It's capitalized. It's claws all the time. Like a dog, you're always going to see claw marks. Um, if it's C, little c and little r, claws rarely. Like cats, they retract their claws. C-O, claws often. Um, so it's pretty self-explanatory. So if we were looking at this formula, F2, sometimes 4, H2, sometimes 4. What animal do you think that is? It's two toes in the front, two toes in the back. 
see them all the time here. I go with deer. So that's, that's your white-tailed deer. Um, but sometimes you see four. And some people are like, well, deer don't have four toes. But if you look at... The deer tracks, that sometimes you'll see these two little dots behind the, the two toes. And those are from the dew claws which are two little rudimentary toes that are a little bit further up on the leg. And when the animal is um, walking in a deep substrate, like snow or some really squishy mud, and the foot goes down, those two little dew claws will make it the ground. If they are moving very quickly, they're coming down heavily on those feet. So yeah, the leg comes down further, you're gonna see the dew claws then as well. Um, so often, usually you just see two, sometimes you're gonna see four. Right. So I've got four, four of the basic families here with their formula. The dog family, capital F4, little h, 4C. So which feet are bigger, the front or the back? The front feet are larger, capital F. How many toes on the front? Four. How many toes on the back? Four. Go see claws? Yes. But how is that different from cats? Because doesn't a cat claw foot look a lot like that? And I don't have cats up here because there's not a lot of wild cats around. We may get um, bobcats around the area. But certainly around here you're going to get house cats. So the cat formula is going to look very similar, except it probably has CR here. But the footprint is going to look different. And the difference is, with your canines, the front two toes are even with each other, and the back two toes are even with each other. Whereas on a cat, cat's toes are more like your hand. You've got one real long finger. Then they kind of go down in size on either side. Okay, So you're not going to have this nice symmetry here with a cat that you will with a dog. That's one difference. Another difference is most of your canine tracks tend to be oval shaped whereas cat tracks tend to be round. One of the exceptions is going to be foxes. Foxes have roundish tracks and can often be confused with cats. And just to make it even more confusing, the gray fox, which is the cat-like <coughs> dog, has semi-retractable claws and can climb trees. Mm -hmm. So nothing is ever simple. <laughs> But the other thing you can look for if you've got really good substrate that's taking really good tracks for you is this pad here. It's called the proximal pad. That's basically this part. And on the dog, it's got one bump on it. On cats, it's going to have two bumps on it. So that's another thing you can look for. So you look for the shape of the track. You look for the alignment of those toes. And if you can see it, see how many bumps are on that. And that can really help you out. Okay. The weasel family. Who can name me one of the many different species of weasels? Mink. Mink, yes. I've got another one. Ferret. Oh, ferrets, but they're not native animals here. They're, they're domestic pets. <laughs> but the, I did not. You are you are true. That is very true. Um, how about wild wild weasels that we might have around here? We've got mink. What else? Mushroom. They're a rodent. <coughs> so they wouldn't be in the weasel family. Weasel, okay, short tail weasel, long tail weasel. There's also the least weasel, but they're really up north, so you're not going to have them down here. Squirrels count? Nope, they're in the rodent family also. Yeah. Okay, so we've got short tail weasel, long tail weasel. Mink, how about another one that's in the water a lot? No, that's a rodent. It's a rodent. Um, long and thin, I like to catch fish. Otter. Okay, otters in the mink family. How about the low one on the ground, digs tunnels in the ground, about this big, um, gray and white stripes, fierce badger. Okay, and then the other one that is the symbol of Michigan, 
Wolverine. The Wolverine. Um, so those are some of your those are your your native weasels. Um, you're also going to have the Martin up north and the Fisher. So a lot of species of weasels that we don't even think, wow, we really do a lot of weasels here. So learning the weasel track is really kind of nice. Um, we were very excited earlier this year um, to have not only weasels uh, visiting our, our bird feeding station and taking out ch chipmunks, <laughs> but um, we had a mink more than once that was living under the brush pile there, and, it, and I have a photograph series of it coming out and grabbing a chipmunk and running off with it. Very cool. Mink tend to be by the water, which is why I was so surprised to see it at our bird feeding station. Um, but there's wetlands around, and it knew where there was a free lunch, and why work hard when the chipmunks are just sitting there? Um, so your weasels. Which foot's bigger, the front foot or the hind foot? Back foot. The hind foot's larger. Um, five toes on the front, sometimes you only see four. Five on the back, sometimes you only see four. <coughs> Weasels are the only ones you... Weasels and raccoons and possums. And raccoons and possums are on the, in their own categories. Um, but the weasel family is the only family that's got five and five. So if you see traps with five and five, chances are it's a weasel. Unless it looks like a human handprint, then it's a raccoon. Or it looks like it's got this really big thumb pointing down like this, and that's the opossum. But if it's five and five, think weasels. And the thing that you can tell with weasels is they have this one, three, one arrangement with their fingers. So if you think of you know, Spock doing this, okay, you think of weasels doing this. A lot easier to do. Um, this is, of course, an exaggeration. But believe it or not, when you see the tracks out there, you can actually see three toes in the middle grouped together with one off to the one side and one off to the other side. So that does make them um, a little bit easier to identify if you can see that. You won't see that with a raccoon. And again, with a possum, you're going to have that big thumb pointing down, so that's really obvious. And then finally, the rodents. Back feet are larger, four in the front, five in the back. And only rodents are four and five. So this would be your mice, your squirrels, the beaver, the muskrat, the porcupine. Those are all rodents. So you're going to look for four and five. Claws rarely, but if you get a little nice dusting of snow, it looks like somebody just had a bag of flour that went poof on the driveway, and something has walked, or squirrels walked across that, you can just see how knobbly their toes are, and you can see the claw marks with that. Um, that's excellent tracking medium for looking for footprints. Most of the time, though, well, where I'm from, <laughs> you don't see footprints proper because the snow is too deep. We don't seem to have that problem here um, most of the winter. Um, mud is excellent for tracking. If you want to look at footprints, go down near streams. That's an excellent place to go and you can really test your knowledge on these. Um, but we're going to concentrate more on gates because if you are out in the wintertime tracking animals, um, you're going to be spending more time looking at holes in the snow than actual footprints themselves. And that's because <laughs> The footprint is way down there in the snow somewhere. So we need to know some terminology so that we can talk about gates and how an animal moves. So a gate is how an animal moves. Um, could be walking, could be trotting, could be a gallop. Running is something technically only things with two legs can do. So I could run, you could run, a bird can run, dogs don't run. Okay, they are trotting, they're galloping, they're loping, they're walking, they're not running. Um, but that's just one of those picky little technical things. Um, the measurements. Two of the important ones are stride and straddle. And tools for measuring them, you can always take out a measuring tape with you. Measuring tapes, nice and compact, fit in your pocket, but sometimes they get floppy. Um, so one of the things that they really recommend is a carpenter's ruler because 
that's not going to flop around too much. And you can also get length and width of your footprint at the same time by doing this. Um, so that's one of the nice things about this. So you can take this out. Um, it's one outfit out of Vermont called Keeping Track. They've made this little ruler, which is kind of nice. Um, same uh, measurements on both sides, so you can get length and width of your tracks in one photograph without having to take two and move your ruler around. So if you are out there and you are tracking an animal, I'm just going to throw these down as footprints. There's my footprints in the snow. And I want to measure the straddle. What I'm going to measure is the distance from the rightmost side of the rightmost track to the leftmost side of the leftmost track. So I'm conveniently lining these up with the lines on the floor so that I'm going to measure from this line to this line. And that's going to be the straddle, so the width of the straddle of my tracks. Why do I need to know this? I need to know this because that's going to change depending on how the animal moves. The faster an animal goes, the narrower that straddle is going to become. If I'm just walking across the room, where do my feet land? They pretty much land the same distance as my shoulders apart. But if I decide to run across the room, which I can do because I have two legs, Okay. What's going to happen to that stride, to that straddle? Okay, it's going to come in so that the foot, when I'm on one foot, it's underneath my center, and so it can balance my weight better. So the faster this animal goes, the smaller that straddle is going to become. It's going to become narrower. Okay. The other distance we measure is the stride length, and this is the one that everybody does differently. But after today, you will all do it this way. <laughs> um, you pick a foot. Doesn't matter what foot. You pick a part of that foot. Doesn't matter what part. And for this illustration, I picked the back of the back foot. This animal is going that way. And its back feet are landing in front of its front feet. So I'm picking the back part of the back foot. But I could have picked the front of this foot. I could have picked the front of this foot, does not matter. Whatever I pick, I'm going to stick to that and always measure that one. So I measure where this is to the next time I see it. And that's my stride length. So if these were my critters here, okay, let's make them nice and even. Okay. Where am I going to measure from where to where? I could measure from the front here. The next time it lands, which is there, the front there. I can measure from the back to the back. I can do this one and this one. doesn't matter. Whatever you do, just be consistent. <coughs> and that's my stride length. So that's how far I have stepped. Now, with most animals, when they are walking, um, this gives you a very specific measurement. So I'm going to volunteer. Sure, whatever. OK. Help you out. <laughs> All right, everybody gets to volunteer in this one. I just want you down on your hands and knees and face that way. Okay. You didn't mention that. <laughs> okay, so actually, you can turn this way. No. Turn your body. There we go, there we go, okay. Now. You gonna ride me? I am not going to do that. But if he was to pretend his knees were his actual back feet, rather than his, his feet being his back feet, um, so if you can move your knees back a little bit so you're, there you go, oh, perfect, okay. Now, when he's walking, his stride length is going to be the same distance from his shoulder to his hips, okay. Can you make that any smaller? Like, um. Okay, can you um, shorten the distance from here to here? Oh, mm, that would look hurt my spine. No, you can't. Okay? You cannot change that distance. Thank you. Okay. So, you, when the animal is walking, and you can measure that stride length, you know approximately how large your animal is. So you're looking at the tracks and, you're, and maybe they're old tracks, they're not very good tracks, you're like, is this a fox or a coyote? You can't tell. If it's only about this wide, this long a stride, it's going to be a fox, because a coyote cannot go 
a stride length that low because they can't shorten this distance. Okay? On the other hand, if it's this big, <coughs> that could be fox or coyote. Why? Because as the animal goes faster, that stride length is going to get longer. So if I'm walking across this room, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps to get here walking. If I decide to run across the room in slow motion, one, two, three, four, five. Okay? So my stride length got longer. So measuring that can give you an idea of how fast the animal's going. It can also give you an idea of how big the animal is within some reason. When an animal is trotting, that stride length can be one to three times the distance it would be when it's walking. So if somebody says that, that the animal could jump 10 feet, and you're thinking, well, that's an awful long distance for you know a coyote to jump. But that's three times, okay, if, if you're looking at the, if you're actually not jumping but trotting um, at a real good clip, that can be a, quite a distance if they can go up to three times their body length in a, in a, in a single step. Okay, the other word is scat, which are animal food. All right, and I forgot to mention why the calf is bigger or the H is bigger. So we're going to just quickly back up to that. And when you know that, suddenly it'll make a lot of sense. Let's say we have a deer in front of us. Okay, it's standing here, its head is over here, its tail's over here, and we cut it in half. Which half of that animal is going to weigh more, the front end or the back end? The front, okay? Because they've got big heads, especially if it's a, a male deer, and it's going to have, say, antlers on it. Okay, it's got to have a uh, strong neck to support all that and all those muscles and then power in the front to move all this weight above it. So that's going to weigh more. It's going to be bigger feet in the front to support that extra weight. Um, take bear. You've got a bear standing here. They cut the bear in half. Which end weighs more, the front or the back? The front. Back. Huh? They got real big butts. <laughs> <laughs> real big butts. So, Bear, which feet are bigger on a bear? Their back feet are big. Okay, look at ourselves. Now, mainly, most of us aren't walking around on our hands. But what's bigger? Your hands and your feet. Feet, because your weight is on your feet. Okay. So that's one another thing you can look at when you're when you're following tracks. And why do you need to know that? Because again, will help you learn how the animal is moving, where those back feet are landing relative to those front feet. <coughs> All right, so now we get into the fun stuff, which is learning animal gates. And everybody gets to play. And you're going to have two front feet and two back feet. the camera, so we won't, would you like to play too? There you go. I get four front feet and four back feet. All right. <coughs> Some basic things. We're going to start with the simplest track, which is a walk. And any animal can do any of these gates. Um, some animals just prefer certain ones, and we'll talk about that as we go along. So, yes, it can walk, but you rarely see it walking. I've seen it, it looks weird. Okay. Here's my animal, it is walking, and it's going that way. What do you notice? Or the hind or the front or vice versa? Okay. Yes. 
you know what? I did this back. This is the first time I've done this wrong. See, I'm, I'm working on very little sleep. Because can your front foot land where your hind foot already landed? Not not if you're going uh, if you're going real fast, perhaps. Be walking back if you're going forwards. That's it. All right. So what do you notice? <laughs> the hind foot has landed where the front foot was. This is what we call a direct register. Um, and why do you suppose an animal will put its hind foot where its front foot already landed? Are there any reasons for this that you can think of? Is it harder to track them? Okay. Um, if they're traveling in a pack, say they're coyotes or wolves, um, it's harder to tell how many of them there are. So as a predator, you can hide your numbers. Okay. Um, what else? I would think it depends on what the terrain is, is they know it's a safe spot to stop. Okay. That could be, certainly, if it's really loose rocks or something, certainly. Um, and along those lines also, deep snow. Think about deep snow. Um, I don't know if you've had experience with deep snow. <laughs> but even snow that's only this deep, if you just go out and, you know, back where I came from, we lived, I lived up in the mountains, and everybody had wood stoves. So you had to go out to the wood shed to get more wood. Okay, snow's this deep. And you didn't put your snowshoes on. And you're not going to shovel. So how hard is it going to be to get to that woodshed? OK. Now if I've got two more legs that have got to go there as well, am I going to punch a hole for each of those legs? No, it's much easier to put my back feet where my front feet already were. It's going to save me energy. And in the winter time, well, any time of year, but especially in the winter time where it's going to be very cold, um, saving energy is what it's all about. Because if you don't have energy, you're going to expire. So anything you can do to save energy, walking on the roads, walking on track trails all the time repeatedly, walking in your own footsteps is going to help you survive just a little bit longer. So direct register. Their hind foot lands where their front foot landed because it helps them save energy. Now, this is a walk. goes left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, ad nauseum. Um, the same distance apart always reminds me of, okay, I'm dating myself here. I love Lucy. <laughs> You've all seen reruns, I hope. The candy machine. And the cooked candies are coming out, one after the other, plop, 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 plop. Okay. This is kind of what this is. It's very even, very symmetrical, left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, now, as the animal goes faster, these feet are going to get closer together, and the stride is going to increase, right? So my straddle is decreasing. Oops, get over there. And my stride is increasing. Okay. The animal's still walking though. But What's also going to happen, because my animal is going faster, this hind foot is going to start to land in front of that front foot. So now you're going to see, sometimes you may see them overlapped, sometimes you may see them like this. Okay. And this is where knowing which foot is larger can help you. Because if you know that this is a coyote you're, tra you're tracking, and the front feet are larger, and you see that there's small feet in front, you know this animal is walking very quickly. So what do you suppose happens if it's going to walk slowly? It's just going to look different. The other way around. Okay, so what's going to happen to the straddle? Which is the width. It's going to increase. What's going to happen to the stride length? It's going to get shorter. So my tracks are going to be shorter and fatter. And then where's that hind foot going to lay on relative to that front foot? Yeah, it's going to lay on this side. Like so. So, anybody here have cats at home? All right. Think of your cat. Walking along, direct register. It sees something, a mouse. What does it do? First thing it does is it stops. 
it crouches down. So the butt may wiggle a little bit. <laughs> okay, and then it starts to stop. A stop is a slow walk. And if you watch your cat stop, this little animal moves her one foot at a time, ever so slowly, not going very fast. So this is not leap, moving any further forward than where this was. So this foot was here, moved here. This is landing behind where that was because I'm moving so slowly. Okay? So that's, when they're stopping, that's what's happening. Then, if it decides it's going to go for it, or maybe just sneak a little closer, it might go into a fast walk, which is an amble, where you'll see it's moving fast enough that that hind foot's going to swing in front of where that front foot landed. Okay, so this is where having pets really works well, because how many of us are going to actually go out and find foxes and track them right away? Not too likely. Um, but your dog and your cat, oh yeah, perfect specimens of um, so there you go. You're, they're walking. A fast walk is a stalk. Narrow, longer, hot and foot in front. And that's an amble. A slow walk is a stalk. Wider, shorter, hind foot landing behind that front foot. When they're walking, one foot moves at a time, regardless of speed. So left, right, left, right, front, back, front, back. One foot at a time. Can you tell that from the tracks? No. You have to actually be watching the animal to see that happen. Now, the reason I mentioned that is because the next set of gates looks like that. Look familiar? Okay. So my animal's trotting now, it's not walking. Can you tell that from, from looking at the tracks? Only if it's doing a fast trot. Remember we talked about that stride length? Okay, so if it's trotting as it's going along with a good clip, that stride could be up to three times the length of that animal. If, however, you're watching your animal, you can tell if it's trotting because it moves two feet at a time. So walking is one foot at a time, trot is two feet at a time. Who would like to be my next kidney pig? Come on. Okay, I got a question in a row. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> it's far. Come on. Okay. You don't need your hands and needs to face her in the corner. Yeah. If she was going to be trotting at what we call a normal trot, two feet at a time are going to move forward at the same time. And they're going to be the opposite feet. So these two are going to move forward, then these two are going to move forward. Okay, you ready? Go for it. Not normal for us to move this way, but you did a great job. Not going anywhere yet. You can back up. You can back up. Okay, so that's a normal trot. On the other hand, they could also be what we call a pacer. And pacers move the same side at once. So these two move, then these two move. Now try it. Oh, you did very good. <laughs> but you don't want to stop and think too much about it because then you get confused. But you did a very good job with that. Thank you very much. Have a seat. So what is the difference? Most animals are not natural pacers. Um, you're going to see them doing a normal trot. Um, anybody here familiar with racetracks? I'm sorry. Well, horses, right? Horses. Yeah. You've got your trotters and pacers. Okay. A, nor a horse's normal gait would be a regular trot, and they're happy to do that trot, trot, trot. But, they will train them to do pacing. I'm not sure why, <laughs> but I don't move in the circles of gambling, so I don't know why they would make them do this. So they have to be trained special to be pacers because that's just not normal for them to do that. That's normal for a camel, which is weird. It's normal for a mutt. Not necessarily a purebred dog, but a mongrel dog. So my dog, was a natural pacer. His normal gait when we would go for a walk was pace. No matter how slow or how fast we went, well to a point, um, he would pace and that was that was his gait. Um, so if you have a dog, take it for a walk, see how it moves. It'd be very interesting. Um, 
So you can't tell that looking at the ground, though. You can only tell that if you're watching the animal. So here we have, again, upside down backwards, a hind foot on top of the front foot, <laughs> direct <laughs> register. And if it was going fast that, and it was trotting quickly, okay, the hind foot would be in front of the front foot, would have a narrow straddle, have a long stride, and if it was trotting slowly, it would be the opposite way. Okay, pretty easy. Then we get to the fun ones. You're going to get my guinea pig on the fun ones. <laughs> okay. The fun ones are the full bound and the half bound. <laughs> now, both the trot and the walk are left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, nice, evenly spaced. Everything else after this is going to be somehow a group of all four feet and then a space, then a group of four and a space, a group of four and a space. So that's one way you can tell if they're walking or trotting. It's just going to be bump, 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 bump. Everything else is going to be four, four, four. So here we have the full bound. Think leapfrog. Okay, because my animal is still going that way. I picked you because you look like you might be athletic. <laughs> okay, so you're going to come down here. And you're going to have to face them. And swing yourself this way. Okay, you're going to get up on your feet. You're going to be like this. Okay, now some people find this easier, and I do apologize for the hard floor, by making fists and using their fists because it's less distance than having to move your hands like this. So you're going to move like a squirrel, because that's what made these tracks with a squirrel. So what's going to happen, is, and the faster you go, the easier it will be, trust me. Okay, you're going to put both front feet down, and then you're going to transfer your weight to those front feet, and your back feet are going to swing in front and land in front. Okay. It's kind of like leapfrog, if you can go from back, from back, from back, that fast, it'll be a lot easier. Show us how it's done. <laughs> oh, well, you know, we won't look. <laughs> okay. Yep. That's really tight. Okay. Yeah, these pants. That's tight. Would somebody else like to give it a shot if you wear slightly looser pants? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, these pants are way too tight. You want to try in these pants on? <laughs> Come on up, you're next. You look like you're wearing relatively loose pants. You look relatively athletic. Okay. Yep. Uh, and it's hard, again, if you go slow, it's difficult because you can't keep your balance. So, really, the faster you go, the easier it becomes. Okay, so she's doing it. That wasn't bad, it wasn't bad, okay? And your tracks, when you did that, came across more like this, which you will see, because this animal is going slower or faster? Slower. Slower, okay? Again, because the faster they go, the further front those hind feet are going to land. So, <coughs> when you were doing it, when Caitlin was doing it, her feet were still back here, which was real slow, um, because, you know, her squirrel had tight fur. <laughs> and when Emily was doing it, her fur was a little looser, so she was able to get about like this. Okay? If I was younger, and these pants are really big on me, if I was younger, I would be able to go a little bit further because I got a lot more of the building and these are for sweat sweatpants or something like that. Um, so that's your full bound. And full bound tends to be done by animals as a preferred gait animals who can climb trees, so squirrels, mice, and so on and so forth. Whereas the half bound, which looks like that, tends to be done by things that can't climb trees. But it has another advantage, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So this tends to be the preferred gait of things like rabbits and snowshoe hare. Um, you'll see, again, if you take your dog out for a walk and you decide to go running up a hill, 
and your dog can't run up the hill because he's got four legs. But <laughs> he will use this to go up the hill because this is a very powerful gait because what happens is your front feet land and then that you pivot on those so your back feet land and your back feet are going to be your power feet. Think of a rabbit, how big those back feet are. Okay? And then it uses those powerful back feet to throw itself forward and land on those front feet. Pivot on those front feet so the back feet can swing forward and throw the animal forward again. Um, so it's a very powerful gait and so dogs and deer will use this to go up hills because it gives them a little more oomph to get up the hill. <coughs> the other thing about this is which is going to give you more maneuverability left and right? That or this? Think about the placement of those front feet. Be the half bound because if my, both my front feet are landing like this, uh, uh, I, I can't turn. Okay? Whereas if one's going, oh, I gotta go this way because there's something on my tail, or I wanna go that way because something's on my tail, I have much more maneuverability because they're not landing at the same time. On the other hand, if I'm climbing a tree, that's gonna help me grasp a lot better both feet at the same time. I do one, ah, you know, not so good. So both feet at the same time. So that's just some general things you can remember. Um, does that mean squirrels never do this? No, they will. When they're going across the ground from tree to tree. Does that mean rabbits never do this? No, they will. Um, they just tend, squirrels and mice tend to do that more often. Rabbits and hares tend to do this one more often. Um, but uh, it's a fun one. I love having kids doing this and they're hopping all over the room. It's a lot of fun. Ugh. Younger days. Then we get into the tricky ones. Which would be... Then you know the, the, the um, canter. I know the word. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> In the I'm horse world, the, the noise I can't use the word walk any longer. So I can't, the, the, no, you can't use run. Faster. You can't use run. Oh, that's right. Faster than walk. Then. Um, in the horse world, a lope is a canter. Um, so when we talked about walks, they move one foot at a time. Trots, they move two feet at a time. With the bounds, both hind feet move together. The front feet might be side by side or one at a time. With the lope or with the canter, if you were listening to the animal, you're going to hear three beats. One, two, three. One, two, three. But they got four legs, so how is that possible? One side. One sitting on the ground at the same time as another. Yeah, two feet are landing at the same time. Okay, this is not. This is a very difficult for gait for people to demonstrate because we do not move this way. Um, every time I teach this, I have to look it up because the way where I used to work, the way we used to teach it was wrong. Um, so I need a a guinea pig. Oh, good for you. <laughs> We're going to sell this to YouTube. It's a smile for the camera. Okay. <laughs> okay, now, you're not going to be on hands and knees like him because you're going to need your feet. So okay. you're going to be on your hands and feet. All right, now, here's what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You are going to, okay, let's say, blah, 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 blah. All right, we're going to have you stand next to this just so we get the placement right. Okay. And they are doing theirs. Uh, okay. 
they are doing theirs in a rotary, so their rotary loop looks like this. Okay, you are going to place your, this foot here. Okay, so one hand down here. Oh, hand. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then this foot mm -hmm. is going to go, and well, we're going to kind of do it this way. Okay. There. And then we're going to have this foot mm -hmm. is going to be this H. So like that. So you yeah. Step forward like that. Well, not yet, because you got to have all four feet on the ground. Okay. Do I need a position there? Uh-huh. <laughs> I can't do I don't think so. <laughs> it would be just, just over just on this side. Yeah. <laughs> and chances are this would, would come around the outside, but that's okay. Oh, oh, you're being very smart there. And then this foot is going to be there. <laughs> that's how it's okay. going to land, right? So ultimately, yeah, because this animal's obviously not going to have all four feet on the ground at once like this because it's moving along and two of those feet are landing at the same time which are going to be these two this one hang on a minute mm -hmm. all right here's the question okay these two here this one's leaving the ground just as this one is landing this one is leaving okay, so, the ground so so we're going to have, okay, we've got the front foot here, which is, this is this foot here. Okay, so that's landed here. Uh -huh. And then as this foot is coming up, this foot is coming down here. So this, this. Yeah. And then now you are completely suspended in the air. Okay. And as you are coming down, your right hind foot, so I've gone this way, this way, I'm flying, and then this foot's landing here. So one, and two, then three. These two are almost hitting simultaneously. So one and four are doing pretty much the same yeah. time. Okay, uh, hang on, okay. Right. So one and four is hitting from back four to push me forward. Up two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> like that. More uh, good enough, like I said, we don't move this way. <sighs> okay? But picture, again, where I came from, this was the common gate of the fisher. If we saw some mysterious three legged animal moving through the woods, it was the fisher. And it looked like three because you got a direct register in the middle here. Thank you, Sue. You did an excellent job. <laughs> okay? So, that was, if we saw this, we knew we had a fisher. Um, you don't have fishers here. <laughs> but you will see deer doing this, you'll see coyotes doing this, because this is essentially a slow gallop. So if our animal moves into a full gallop, What has happened? Okay. Both hind feet are now in front of both the front feet. And what we tell people is, if you were to imagine an imaginary line in front of that front foot, any time that hind foot lands, even partially behind that line, it's a lope. So this is a regular lope. That would be a slow lope, because he's going real slow, that hind was landing behind. He's speeding up, but he's still lope, 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 loping. Ah, oh, that's where he's, he's galloping. Okay, so as soon as that hind foot lands in front, it's a gallop. And now he's really cruising. Okay? Any questions on the lope gallop at this point? These are the two confusing ones, the hardest ones to remember. Because there's more to it. Okay? This is, again, where knowing which feet are bigger makes it a little bit easier to tell. Um, you're following a deer. Which feet are bigger? The front feet. So you got two big tracks here, two little tracks there. <coughs> the faster the animal goes, the further apart this set of four is going to be from that set of four. 
So if you're galloping slowly, they could almost look like a trot. Left, right, left, right, left, right, because they're so close together that in between distance is going to be small. But if you notice, it's not direct register. You can see both the front feet, both the hind feet. Then you know, okay, this animal's galloping. It's not walking. It's not trotting. No matter how close together that stride like this. Okay, things to look for. Now, that one quick question. Yeah, go go. Or the canter has the three knees, mm -hmm. where the gallop would just have the two feet, correct? Four. Those are one, two, three, four. Okay. Because each foot, your back to one foot will be at a time in a gallop. Yeah. So with the gallop, there's a couple different kinds of gallops. This one is what we call transverse or zigzag. It looks like a Z or a lightning bolt or a zigzag like this. Okay, so it goes left, right, left, right. And if my animal is just cruising down the road, through the woods or whatever, trying to get from point A to point B, this is probably what he's going to do if he's in a real hurry. If he's being chased by something, or is chasing something, so it's a coyote chasing a snowshoe hare, okay? What's that snowshoe hare doing? Zipping back and forth and all around trying to get away. So you've got to be maneuverable too. So your, your, your hair suddenly makes a break from the left. This isn't going to help you. But if you change so that you're running, you're running, you're galloping like this, you're in a rotor right now. And the way you've placed your feet, you're going to turn to the left. Okay, if you turn to the right, you're going to go this way. Turn to the right. Okay. So there's a lot of ways animals can move. And you can get some of the story by looking at, at, at their tracks here and seeing how they're moving, which way they're going. Yeah, just to, to um, throw uh, some more fun stuff in there. Dogs often walk or trot this way. Okay, they do a sideways. Okay, so if you take your dog out, or if you had a chance to watch a coyote or a fox, they're often moving this way. Two front, two highs on the same side. So you're going to see this weird thing where all the big feet are on one side and all the small feet are on one side. You're going to say, what the heck is the animal doing? Because they have slewed their hips to one side, so they're moving this way. Why? Because they can keep an eye on what's it's coming this way. So there's another thing you can do. Remember at the beginning, I told you how trackers can tell if the animal's looking over his shoulder? Okay. Watch what happens to my feet when I look over my shoulder. Okay. I'm walking along. Did you see what happened? Okay. My toes pointed a different direction. And so that made the tracks, instead of going this way, suddenly we're going this way. So you can tell when an animal has, has done that by the placement of its feet looked over its shoulder. It's kind of cool. Any questions on these gates? Now's your chance. So on the floor with your H's and F's. You can take your cheat sheet if you need it. And your animals are all going to be basically moving towards that corner of the room. So we're going to start with the walk. First, your animal can move towards me. Okay. Um, so lay them out like your animal is walking, not flying fast, not slow, just a normal walk. And don't make a mistake, I apparently made several times. Do you care what animal it is? Or? It can, it's, you're doing a fox. Remember, I had more cars than you did, so. <laughs> okay, now if you're walking normally, you're going to get that direct register. And so the high foot's going to land right on top of where the front foot was. 
Yep. Yeah. All, all animals when they walk will do this. So basically, if you just put your H's out there, it'll be only different. Okay. Now your animal is going to speed up a little bit. So what's going to happen to the stride? The stride is going to get longer. The straddle will get narrower. And the high foot's going to land in front of the front foot. Because it's going faster. So it's walking along at a pretty good clip. Okay. And it suddenly sees a mouse, so it's going to go into a stalk. So a real slow walk. So the straddle will widen. The stride will shorten, and the hind foot's landing behind the front foot. Excellent. All right, show me a full bound. This is going to be a squirrel. Make it for a tree. Excellent. And your squirrel has suddenly morphed into a rabbit. Amazing. Half bounds. Very, very good. All right. Who could try to show me a loop? Okay. Mysterious three-legged animal going through the woods. And you don't want to copy the person next to you because that person's wrong. I did mine first, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <coughs> Yours is pretty good. Your animal is doing a gallop. No, actually, your animal is doing a fast walk. Or it could be a fast trot. Because you want to have one front foot and then a direct register in the middle, hind foot on the front foot or next to it, and the other hind foot out front. Okay. All righty. Now, show me a fast lope, but not a gallop. Oh, we want to drop that front foot back. Back, 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 back. There you go. So, remember that lope line we talked about? See, there's so many things to remember now. Which one is it? La, la, la. Okay? So, if it's a fast lope, where is that hind foot going to move? It's going to move in front of the front foot. So, you've got it, you've got it. Now, you've got it. Good. You're just sped up a little bit. Good. Yours is on a full gallop now. So you want to drop that back so it's not completely in front of the front. No, nope, no, nope. drop that back where it was, okay? Nope. That's good. Yeah, well, so, like that. All right. And now put it in a full gallop, and he's going to turn to the right. So it's going to be a C turning to the right. Okay, yours is, is doing a transverse, so it's still going straight. And yours is still going straight. There you go, you got it. Yep, yep, move that H. There you go, and you want to get your H off your F, very good. And yours is going to the left. That's okay, yours is just, yours is just dyslexic, you know. Can't tell us the first right now. Now swing the middle F and H out this way a little bit. There you go, so it looks like a letter C. Excellent. Okay, give me a half bound. Okay, how about an amble? Stalking, you want to go into a fast walk. So move the H the other direction. There you go. Good, good. Mm. You got a slow loaf going on. Okay, and then what are you going to do with this one? Drop. Yep. Either move the H back by the F or the F up by the H. 
you want both lefts and then both rights. Okay. It's all clear as mud? Yep. <laughs> okay. It takes a while. You know, it starts off, it seems pretty easy. And then as we get into them, it can become quite confusing. Um, but all it takes is really just practice, 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 practice to learn this part. Um, are there any questions on animal movements? This bit of it? I got one. Yeah. As far as the uh, behind the front feet, know which one's which, so without actually knowing what animal it is first, when you're trying to identify which one's the bigger one. <coughs> well, if you start with something simple like a rabbit, okay, you, all, you already know in your head that the, the back feet are bigger. So if you're looking at rabbit tracks, they're easy to tell. Um, other than that, if you know none of the information we've given you today, then you're not going to know. Um, if you have learned the track formula, or if you can picture the animal in your head, you can't remember the track formula, but you're picturing a deer, which is going to be bigger, the front of the back feet, where's most of the weight, those are going to be the bigger feet. Now you know, now you can tell if you know you're following a deer. Um, if you recognize it's a dog track, um, again, cut your dog in half, which is going to be bigger, the front end or the back end? And the front end's bigger because they got the head and they've got all that power in the front, so the, the, that, the front feet are going to be bigger on a dog. Same with a cat, because it's got the head up there, it's got to be able to support more weight. So those feet are all going to be bigger. Um, raccoons have big butts, so those feet are going to be bigger. So if you think about the animal, if you have a rough idea of whose tracks they are, then you can tell which is front and back. You just think about the animal where it's bigger, then you'll know those tracks are going to be the bigger ones, the front ones, and that ones need to tell. It helps. Um, and around here, most of the tracks you're going to find are going to be deer, which we all know deer. Um, squirrel, extremely common. Um, and squirrel, the back feet are bigger. And they do that, that bound thing. So now you're going to, you're going to have in your head you know the full bound, and it's probably going to be a squirrel. Um, the only ones that might be confusing would be the dogs and cats. <coughs> and after today, you know that the back feet are bigger. Um, and also with your dogs and cats, they tend to prefer a trot or a walk. So if you see left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, it's going to be probably a dog or a cat. <coughs> your wild dogs, especially the foxes, very narrow chest, so when they're trotting, they can get those front feet all the way in like this, so that the line of tracks in a trotting canine, a wild canine, can be an almost perfect straight line. <coughs> Whereas if it's Rover down the street, okay, Rover is probably overfed <laughs> and can't quite get those feet like lined up like this. <coughs> but also, Rover, being Rover and being well fed, is not necessarily on a mission. Not looking for food, not going on a destination. <coughs> it doesn't matter if he wastes energy. So Rover's tracks are going to be like, oh, what's over here? Just, oh, wait, 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 it smells really good over here. Just, oh, what's this over here? It goes over here. Okay, Dogs are all over the place. Whereas your coyotes, your foxes, they haven't got time to waste checking out everything like that. They've got to go to get food. So that's another thing you can file away. <coughs> also, dog tracks tend to be spread out a bit more, whereas um, coyotes, they're really compact, really tucked in. Their toes are really tucked in. So there's lots and lots and lots of information. These are the very basic basics. Um, and if you really want to pursue this and follow, learn more, do get yourself some good books. Um, and then there's other repeats, practice. Any other questions on this part of tracking? They can tell the weight of the footprints. Is it too rough for the animal? Really good trackers can. Um, 
get a rough idea. For example, somebody carrying a heavy weight walking through mud is going to leave a deeper track. Um, one of the things that always amazed me is I would take kids out and we would look at tracks and say the snow is this deep. Yeah. And you see these tracks on top of the snow, which to me couldn't be any more obvious. They were squirrel. And I showed it to the kids, and they all go, deer! <laughs> and it got to the point where when I was indoors, I would say, now people often seem to confuse squirrel tracks with deer tracks. <laughs> but let's put them in our hands. We've got a squirrel sitting on this hand and a deer sitting on this hand. Which one weighs more? You know, so you're going like this. So you get outside, you see the squirrel tracks, you think, we're going to get it now. Whose tracks? Deer! Like, no, they're on top of the snow! <laughs> well, I finally figured out why that was. Because we have primarily red squirrels, which are the little guys. <coughs> the kids were used to seeing deer tracks, basically with a big, two big toes and two little toes. Okay? And guess what the squirrel tracks look like? So it was obviously a deer track. <laughs> Even though it was right on the surface of the snow, whereas these guys would punch straight through. Um, so that was the one that most people got confused. And to this day, I finally figured that out. It's still, even still, so I'm like, really? Um, but it took me for, for a while to figure out why they were confusing the two. But um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's all very interesting. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And, and like I said, the best thing to do is practice and take your dog for a walk with that dog. But tracking doesn't stop at footprints. Okay. What else can we do with tracking? I do scats. I like scats. Um, I used to talk to people about getting my ES in scatology and I got a joke. Um, but scats, most people go, ew. But if you go to the Dolly Center, you will find that most of us go, cool! Uh, we get very excited about scats. Uh, we have a nice scat collection. Um, I have found for me, and when I teach scats, um, comparing them to food makes it real easy to remember them. Um, not all people appreciate it, but you know, hey, it works. Um, so for example, your rabbits and hares, they're, they're round, they're small, you look like cocoa puffs. And actually, snowshoe hair really looks like cocoa puffs because they're pretty good size. Um, again, where I came from, we didn't have cocktail rabbits, we had snowshoe hares. So I'm, I'm having to get used to now how tiny rabbits are, how tiny their scats are. Um, but they're round. And actually, we, these are the ones you're most likely to find. These are the second edition of their scats. Because rabbits practice what we call, call coprophagy, which means they eat their own droppings. Because <coughs> the first ones that they release um, still have a lot of vegetable matter in them and a lot of nutrients. So they'll re-ingest those and digest them again. And so the second coming are these little dry, round, hard scats that look like cocoa puffs. Um, I had a professor in college who, it's, we were out once and he looked under the shrub and he says, oh look, snowshoe hair scat. I did not live up in the mountains at that time. And so being the eager student, I'm like, how can you tell me? How do you really know that they're not rabbit? How do you know that they're hair? I'm very serious about this whole thing. And he goes over and he picks them up and pops them in his mouth. No, nope, snowshoe hair droppings, I moved on. Pretty much, that was my reaction. Well, he had put cocoa puffs under the shrub. <laughs> and so he was playing a joke on me. So, you want to really gross out your friends and family? That's a good one to do. So, um, did, you, did you try it in person? I did not. <laughs> it did not go the other way. <laughs> I did try to get him back, though, later on. I did a, uh, we had to do a presentation in front of the classroom, and I did mine on the pomegranate. And if you know your ancient Greek myths, Persephone and um, 
Demeter. She was the goddess of the seasons. Uh, her daughter went to the underworld, and um, because she had eaten the pomegranate, she had to stay in the underworld for half the year, and therefore Demeter created the seasons so that when she was in mourning, when her daughter was in the underworld, it was winter. And then when her daughter came back, it was spring, it was summer, and so on and so forth. Well, it was the story actually has some truth behind it because the pomegranate, and when you eat pomegranate, you're eating the seeds, actually causes temporary sterility in men. So I'm standing up there, slicing up my pomegranate, telling this story, I'm going on and on about the legend, I'm passing it around, I'm making sure everybody has some, I'm waiting until he eats it, then I hit him with, it causes sterility in men. And all the guys in the class go, ooh. <laughs> so that was the closest I got to getting back to me. Um, so deer pellets, how do they look different from hare or rabbit pellets? They're, they tend to be more oval, so think raisinets. They tend to be smaller and oval shaped. They're a darker color. Um, kind of glossy um, when they are separated into individual pellets. Twice a year you will see them in clumps um, and you, I first thought you might think it's somebody's dog but if you look it's actually little pellets all stuck together and what's <coughs> what causes that is twice a year their diet changes. Can anybody tell me what? It's, it is different in winter, so it's just changing in the fall and the spring. Because in the summertime, you're eating grass and tender green things. And then in the wintertime, there's not so much tender green stuff around, usually. Um, so they've got to eat twigs and stuff like that. So in the fall, they're changing to the winter diet. And in the spring, they're changing to the summer diet. So that's when you're going to see more of the clumped pellets, rather than the loose ones like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, fox and coyote, they kind of, they, they are going to have fur in them, and obviously coyote is going to be bigger than fox, so you look at size. Um, and I always think they remind me of a box of chocolates, because you get a box of chocolates, and if you, if you work in a chocolate candy factory, you know that the swirls on the top indicate what's inside. So there's a pattern there. So you think of fox and coyote, they have a long taper down with the curlicue at the end. So that, in my mind, reminded me of the curlicues on top of the chocolates. Um, so if you look for a long tapered end, and the curlicue will be the last strands of hair. Um, and they're going to be furry. Again, where I was from, the coyotes were eating the snowshoe hair, which turned white in the winter. So. This time of year, after the snow is melted and you're going out there, you would see a lot of piles, tight piles of white fur. And it was the, where the, the scats had decayed, and what was left was just the white fur from the snowshoe hairs, which is really kind of neat. Raccoons, long, thick cores look like breakfast sausage. Um, Lake sausages, you know, kind of like Jimmy Dean looking ones that are you know, not, not in a nice casing. Um, and the thing with, with um, raccoon scats, and most people I have found this is not a problem, but for a naturalist like me, it tends to be more of a problem. Um, we like to pick things up. Most people don't. You don't want to touch raccoon scats because raccoons can have um, parasites that are transmissible to people, the brainworm, and you don't want to get that. So if you find you've got sticky fingers, uh, try not to pick up raccoon scats because those can be dangerous. Um, weasel family, thin ropey cords that fold back and forth on themselves. So you think of worms, or I like to tell kids, you know, if you get a tube of toothpaste and you just go with a tube of toothpaste and it goes out on the counter, it's going to start folding back and forth on itself. It looks a lot like this, you know, but don't do that at home. Mom will not be too happy to come in and find a big pile of toothpaste on the counter. And I don't think she'll buy that a weasel is in the house. Um, and these guys tend to, you'll see these on, uh, they're scats on rocks or prominent places where they're marking their territory. And the same with, with uh, foxes and coyotes, they'll often leave a pile marking their territory in prominent locations. <coughs> and 
of the cat family, big Tootsie Rolls, big Tootsie Rolls, because they have the little um, perforations every inch or so on them, because when your cats go, they poop, squeeze, poop, squeeze, poop, squeeze, poop, squeeze. And so you're going to have these little indentations each time. So next time you clean up the litter box, look for that. Um, and this holds true for bobcats, uh, cougars, lynx. So your wild cats are going to do the same thing. So again, I find food makes it easier to remember which ones are which. Um, and it's kind of fun to see these things. Uh, what other ones might we have around here? I have had a lot of people who say, oh, well, owl poops are the best ones to find. Well, owl pellets are cool to find, but that's not a scat. Okay, pellets are coughed up like a hairball from a cat. Um, and they'll be full of bones and fur and feathers or whatever it was they ate. Um, the owl poop looks just like any other bird poop, just whitewashed down the side of the tree. I'm very excited. Unless you're looking for owls, then it's kind of cool when you do find it. Um, see what else? Your rodents tend to have <coughs> pellets that look kind of like this, but they're small. Um, think the mouse in your kitchen, leaving little chocolate sprinkles all over the place. Um, squirrel really has this shape, but going to be significantly smaller because it's not as big as a deer. Um, by kind of the size of sesame seeds, um, unless you get fox squirrels. Didn't have fox squirrels where I was from, so I'm still getting over how big fox squirrels are. Um, there are squirrels and other women here who see if it's dangerous to other animals, or? I don't know. It seemed like there for a while there was a certain, and I thought it was a squirrel, that um, near for horses and stuff like that, that it could cause sickness in the animals. I hadn't heard that. I'll have to look that up. That's interesting. I know mice can. Mice, you want to be careful with hantavirus, which is not really going to, it tends to be more of a deserty sort of a thing, hantavirus. Um, but there was a case. In the AP, there's a lot of it around September, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> Never so often, anyway, you hear about it. But. I, I know there was a case actually back in the Adirondacks where I was from, and it was in one of the lean tos as I say there, they had gotten an antivirus, which was like unheard of. Like, oh my god. Um, yeah, the only one I really know that, that commonly you need to avoid is the raccoon. Um, that said, most people have no reason to touch these things. I had clippies for the same professor one year. He needed something like 2,000 of them. So and that was the, that was a down year for for hairs. So normally. You know, look out your yard and just scoop up handfuls of these things. And that year, that wasn't a hair to be found. So I earned my money that year. Um, other things to look for would be uh, kill sites, browse, where um, animals have been eating plants. Um, two that are real easy to tell apart rabbit and deer browse. Um, rabbit browse, stick, deer browse. Okay. One, you can look at height, but you know, rat deer can also bend down and eat low to the ground. Um, rabbits have very, very sharp teeth, top and bottom, sniff like garden shears, nice 45 degree angle cut. Real easy to tell. Deer, on the other hand, they don't have front teeth here. So imagine trying to bite through something that you've got no teeth on top, like dick. And you get part way through, you've bitten here, and what are you going to do? You can't get the rest of it, so you'll rip it off. So if you have where you see an animal's been eating and it's got this little tag on the end, that's from a deer. Or if you're up north, moose, same thing. Out west, elk, all related. Um, so they'll be not able to um, chew all the way through there. Um, if you really want to get into um, signs of, of uh, animal kills. This is a really good book for that because it will show you the difference between where uh, a hawk has plucked a bird that it caught or a um, bobcat has plucked a bird that it caught. Um, some things will pluck the birds, some gnaw through the feathers. After they're clumped together, being glued together by the saliva and the, the 
fox has gone nine, 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 get it loose, okay, and then they pull the feathers out, that's something to look for. Um, just amazing, amazing amount of information if we know how to look. And, you know, obviously all of our ancestors were able to do this. We've lost the need to do it and therefore the skills to do it. Um, but <coughs> it's still, it's still good to know. Now this is part of an exhibit I just took down. So it's going to look weird because there's parts that are missing. But, like my clay had grease in it. But this was a, a sheet I had put up that had all sorts of animal tracks on it, and they're telling stories. So I don't know if you can see them where you are, if you want to come back down on the floor to get a little closer, and I can interpret what some of the stuff is on here. This was the river, and I had rocks all along the edge here. So picture a bunch of rocks along here. This is a pond. Has frozen over, and I had all sorts of tall grasses, you know, cattail type things there. This is a field, the tall grasses that were here, and I had, well, where each of these greasy spots was was a, was a conifer tree, and then I had a hardwood forest over here. So the question is, what are these tracks telling us? Who made them? Where are they going? And what are they telling us? So we'll start with the easy ones, those big dark ones that are coming over there. <coughs> okay, so whose, whose tracks do you think these most resemble? Deer, okay, which way is it going? Going out of the forest and going over to the water. Yeah, so they're coming towards me, right? Because they point in the direction they're going. Okay, and what's happened here? It does look like a little dance. Okay, um, if it's deep snow, what might they have been doing in the deep snow? They might be digging, trying to find something green to eat. So it looks like there was some digging going on here. Okay, and then this one come on, comes down and comes down to the pond. It does what? Yeah, okay, so it's, it's stopped, so you got all four feet here, and maybe it's getting a drink. Um, maybe there's no snow, maybe there's some ice here, and it's able to walk on the ice and not leave any tracks because there's no snow on there. And then it fell off the edge of the world. Okay. I had a sheet that I did with students, and it, hopefully there's a box still someplace, um, where I had the whole scene drawn out, so it wasn't done with sticks and pine cones and rocks. I actually drew everything on here. And I had a house in the corner, and it was where Bob lived. He took his dog Arthur out for a walk, and that dog peed on everything, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, very full bladder. OK, so our creature who's, who's coming in a straight line is probably a fox, um, very characteristic, probably peed on a tree there, came along here. And then what possibly happened right in this spot? Yeah. Okay, can you see it stopped and all four feet here. Now, I probably should have drawn four feet here because it would have gathered itself up and pounced on something. Um, do we see any signs that it was successful? No, it may, may could have swallowed whatever it was whole. It's possible. Um, but it kept coming along here and, ooh, what happened here? Yeah, so it looks like it did leap here, landed here, and it scrabbled around. Maybe it was a little more successful there. Came along here. Um, can't tell if I put yellow snow there or if it's just a smear from the stuff. Okay, coming along here down to the pond, looped back around this way. And again, I had rocks here. So it jumped up on the rocks, which did not have any snow on them. And then over here, it jumped off the rocks and continued this direction. Okay. This set of tracks here, and I had, didn't tell you about this particular pattern because you don't see it as often down here. Your weasels tend to do two, 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 two. So you mentioned ferrets, so you've probably seen ferrets move like this. 
<coughs> and I call that a two by two lobe. Um, so that's a very common pattern for your weasels to be moving in. Um, so if you see two, 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 it could be, again, depending on the size, you want to get out your measuring tape and you want to measure how big the footprints are, how far they are apart to get an idea. Is it a mink? Is it a weasel? And so on and so forth. Because this is near the water, okay, it came up here, it jumped on the rocks, hopped off the rocks, jumped back down the rocks, went across the water this way. Odds are it's going to be a mink because it's near the water. There. Okay, and then up here, okay, each of these was a tree. <laughs> so this set going from tree to tree here, but you can see a little tail drag. Now obviously these are not drawn to scale because when I tell you that's a mouse that's the same size as the deer, that's kind of scary. So these are not drawn to scale. But with mouse tracks, you often do see a tail drag. So that's kind of cool, but which, which gate is that? If you remove that tail drag, which gate is that? Yep, that's the full bound. And which direction is it coming? Yeah, it's coming towards me. Okay, so it's coming towards me. Okay, how about these guys? From tree to tree. Yeah, that's a squirrel. Have another squirrel there. And, oh, I did not put a rabbit on here. Shame on me. I should have done so. Because usually I've got a coyote chasing a snowshoe hare. But I may have to modify this and add that in here. Um, so this is very, can be, give you an idea of if you go out for a walk, some of the stuff that you can see if you know what to look for and really find um, some really cool stories that are out there, which to me, this is, this is where the joy of tracking comes along. Because I like to just look at it and say, well, gosh, what happened here? One of my best finds um, was in late winter, and I came across some really cool coyote tracks, and it was mainly season. And I could tell where they had made it based on the tracks, which was very exciting. And another time I came across some tracks, again, they were coyotes. It was a nice straight line going along. And all of a sudden, there were four sets of tracks here. And the line kept going with four sets of tracks here. And I looked at that and I'm like, what the heck? I mean, it's like the animal was beamed down and beamed back up. It couldn't explain it. So I went to a fellow who was another tracker. I said, what happened here? So what it was was a pack of coyotes. They're walking in each other's tracks, hiding their tracks so no one knows how many there are. So they're walking along, and one stepped off to the side and then stepped back in the tracks. Maybe was looking at something. So that was very, very interesting there. So again, a lot of this is observation, takes a lot of time. Um, I was out with the same fellow another time, and he. You have to develop a search pattern in your head to recognize certain things. But we had this fox going through the deep snow after in a grassy area after mice. And he said, you see this slightly triangular hole in the snow? We all thought it was just you know, another footprint. It was where his face had gone in the snow to get a mouse. So we could stop and place the whole face in there. So what you saw was the jaw line making that slightly triangular mark in the snow, which was really cool. Um, same animal we were following, and um, it had stopped and left a scent mark on the trail. And he said, um, what do you see? And we're all looking at the same thing, we're like, well, it was the bathroom. Yes, but what do you see? And I went to the bathroom. Well, what do you see? <laughs> and it was a female. How could we tell? By looking at the tracks. So we're like, well, I don't know. Because if you think about where all the functioning parts are on the male and female box, okay? So you've got the front legs and the back legs, and um, not all canine, not, we tend to think that male dogs lift their legs to pee and the females will squat. That's not true. And, and with these animals, it's the alphas, especially pack animals like coyotes and wolves, only the alphas lift their legs to go to the bathroom, both male and female. Um, everybody else had better not do it. It's hierarchy. Only the, male, only the alphas breed, only the alphas lift their legs to pee. So this animal 
um, the urine was right about here. Now, had it been a male, it would have been in front of those front legs. So it had to be a female because it was just behind the back legs. Okay? So it's little things that when you think about it, you're like, well, duh. You felt like a complete idiot because you hadn't noticed that. Um, so you have to develop your observation skills. You've really got to see what, what you're looking at. And that, and that can be very difficult. And we have time to play a fun game. But you'll need to take your shoes off to do it. I'm trying not to fall because the floor is hard. Oh no, I didn't bring it with me. That was the one I didn't bring with me. I had animal scat twister. <laughs> We're going to play twister. And no, I left it at work because I didn't think I'd have time to do it. So we have 20 minutes left to answer any questions you might have on tracking. And we will give you a handout here. Oh, he's answering questions. I'm going to pass these around. <coughs> you guys can fill them out. And you do have time to look at the books over here. Um, and I will collect.